We're having a satsang. We're having a satsang. We're having a satsang. We're having a satsang. That's because we couldn't get the, uh, the opening music to uh, play today because it's the full moon and Christmas coming. So um, here we are, the last satsang of 2013. And welcome and bless your heart and hearts in general for being here. Um, and anyway, I'm taking these headphones off so I can't actually hear my voice when I've got them on anyway. Some weird quirk. And um, yeah, 2013, what a year this has been. What a year. I mean, every year is a year, isn't it? But this one had a particular quality that I have never known before. I think any of us have, have we? It's, it was really, really unprecedented and incredibly powerful and uh, challenging at the deepest, deepest level for so many people, including me, but everybody. I mean, I'm privy to getting hundreds and hundreds of messages every day from people which is people asking for help and telling me their problems and telling me how they feel and so on and so forth. And it's, it's not been horrible though. I mean, yeah, there's been horrible things happening around the world and for people and so on. And there's been some beautiful things happening. It's, it seems like quite a, a balance. There's something quite amazing about the, the quality of the energy that I felt this year. And uh, when I say year, I go solstice to solstice rather than... Uh, the Roman version, because it's a bit more, well obviously it's a lot more accurate, it is accurate um, in terms of years. And um, so here we are, and we're coming up for the, uh, the solstice again, uh, and, and that originally was what the Christmas festival was based on. When the Romans took on Christianity, they uh, were obliged to graft the the new stuff onto the old stuff. They couldn't just lose the old stuff because everyone would just, well, that's all they had, wasn't it? And they didn't have computers and all that kind of thing. They just had stuff like that. So the Solstice Festival, which is as ancient as humankind, um, <coughs> starts on the 21st and all the clans would gather. Um, well, this is way back before the Romans, I mean. Uh, they'd all gather with what remaining meats they had. Uh, allegedly, and uh, which wouldn't have been much by then, really, would it? Because they'd have had three months of uh, not much hunting, while the animals all hibernated, and um, they bring whatever they had and whatever they could to the big feast. And it was called the Festival of Lights, whence came the Jewish Festival, uh, Festival of Hanukkah. No matter what the history or the historical references to that are meant to be, it was actually that festival originally before there was Judaism. So it's that old this stuff. And um, they'd meet and have a five-day blowout because they'd have to come a long way to get there and they must have had magic mushrooms and, and uh, maybe some kind of alcohol, who knows, I don't know. But they lit lots of fires, hence the festival, of, the festival of Lights. And there weren't that many people in the world in those days, but, you know, say, I, in my mind, I've seen 200 gathered, there's probably more, and um, in various spots around the planet and uh, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. And then um, the fifth day, 21st of my mass is perhaps today, but whenever it was, Christmas Day came on like the finale. It was the big finale. And then Boxing Day probably because they started punching the crap out of each other because they had hangovers and been really, really bad. I also reckon a lot of people probably died from food poisoning because if they'd been saving that meat up, I don't know how clever they were at preserving meat. Salmonella would have been pretty rife, I reckon. So be leading up to it. Now imagine this, because this is what I'm, I'm saying all this. Um, this kind of pre-Christmas stress that is endemic. Uh, I mean, I can't talk for everywhere. Every country is different. England, in my experience, is one of the worst or the most stressful. People really get into it here. Um, Germany is they're more methodical about it, but they also do make quite a big deal out of it. The difference being that for them it's Christmas Eve. That's the the the, the feast, and there's not really they don't make such a huge thing of it as as the British do. Uh, Christmas Day for the young ones these days is usually spent dancing in clubs and stuff. The same goes for Ibiza and um, Spain pretty much is like that. They're pretty cool. They don't do much on Christmas Day. It's not like a major big thing. They have the Three Kings Day. I think it's the 7th of January. I can't remember. Um, and so on and so forth. In America, they're very efficient. They don't have time to mess about. So it's kind of like one day, that's it. Pish, 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 you're all back to normal again. Um, so I am talking from a rather Anglo-centric point of view. Um, there's a lot of stress I always find being here before Christmas. And what is that? 
Okay, so we could go into the obvious blatant reasons for it, um, but I think it's actually because it's so deeply biologically wired into our systems. Because if you were building up for the big feast of the clans, you'd have to get all your meat together you'd, a, a few days way before now. You'd have had to prepare it all and pack it all somehow, put it on sledges or whatever you carry stuff around on. You'd have to clean your furs and make sure that they weren't all flea bitten and whatever and do what you did and got yourself together and you'd have to drag the clan across over hill and tail how <laughs> long it was. I mean, I'm making all this up, you must understand. Partly remembering it from the former life, but only partly. And um, it would be stressful. I mean, the journey would be stressful. Everything would be, you know, it'd be hard work. And I think that that's why I did. I mean, they wouldn't have felt it as stress. They'd have just felt it as stuff you had to do, but it was effort, you know. For us, because we've had all our survival needs taken care of for us, um, we turn it into neurosis, basically. And we act it out by getting really frustrated with each other in traffic jams, um, at shops. Um, you know, there's loads of cars on the road, everybody's out there buying stuff, we're going to parties, everyone's a little bit, starting to get a little bit worse for wear uh, from going to all the parties and talking all this shit to each other that you have to do at those things. Some of which can be fun, we all know that, but most of which is pretty laborious and energy draining. Um, and not only that, but because we have a an annual landmark, which I would suggest really pr primordially is the the solstice more than it is actually Christmas. We've just projected it to the big feast day at the end of it. When we have this annual landmark, it gives us a measure by which to see or evaluate how we're doing. And whether we're willing to face that cognitively or not, we feel it. We, we're going through a process. We're recalibrating ourselves against this landmark in the year. And, um, and that's an interesting process to go through, isn't it? I mean, it's always good. Much better if you can make it cognitive, but most people don't have time or the inner technology to do that. And so you get lots of stress occurring, and uh, then there's the money that everyone has to spend on presents, which are most of which is just getting feet chunked very quickly after. And, um, and of course, the coming together of the family. <laughs> well, now, I reckon that the stresses you get in families when they come together for this one day, and it's made such a big deal of, um, is probably going back to when the clans would meet up, there would inevitably be inter-clan strife of some sort, because that's how humans are. And so probably fights would break out between clans while they were all gathered together there, while, you know, once the drink was, uh, or whatever it was, was flowing strongly. Um, and it, not I'm saying every year, but I mean, occasionally it must have happened. There'd have been a bit of a blowout. And I think that's why I've into our circuitry as well. And so there's the stress about whether you're going to be able to get on with everybody and uh, how you're going to keep it all together. And like, look, I'm making light of this, but I know from all the people that I help and stuff that there's a lot of people really, really go through a, a big uh, hell about this whole thing. You know, um, it's, it's not easy for people. And then, of course, there are those people, and there's a lot of them, who aren't connected to any family or don't want to be connected to them, they're, they're alienated from them, or what have you, or don't believe in the whole thing, or just think it's a load of old nonsense, and just aren't part of anything, and feel really isolated and lonely, alone, and, um, and, and or they, they'd probably be fine on the day, but it's the fear of it building up, that sense of, well, where do I belong, you know, who do I fit in with, and all of that stuff, so it, it's a quite <laughs> deep and exacting existential challenge to maintain your angelic nature throughout this. However, there is the underlying subtext of goodwill to all men and women, of course, um, which we're not good at obeying rules, but that goes in somewhere, and we all want to exert goodwill. We all want to, and it's just a matter of knowing how. And um, the answer, obviously, is an answer is, is in opening the heart center on an energetic level. So that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to set ourselves up as solidly and groundedly as we possibly can. Access our true selves, the true nature, which is deep within, psychospatially speaking, in the back of us, the deepest part of us. And uh, having retrieved our power, thus, we, we will then focus on opening the heart and knowing that this is not a thing of the mind, this is not a thing of the opinions and the prejudices and the beliefs and 
the whole constructive version of reality that we're normally getting lost in, and which is uh, whence comes all this pre Xmas stress. If you are thinking that at all, I don't know. Um, uh, by being in the, the big south, so to speak, we're then able to accommodate everyone and everything with equanimity and magnanimity and compassion and empathy. And armed with those four, it's very difficult for anyone else to kind of stir us up into a, a tiz. Um, and if we were to be stirred to a tiz, we'd be able to sit in the back of us and observe it happening being amused at the curious theatre that we've, that we've elicited. Um, I think that, that brings up another thing. When in one's power, as I just described, the, um, the fear of uh, fucking it up uh, diminishes. We're all very, very concerned that what we do is right. For some reason, especially Christmas, it's got to be done right. And uh, the fear of messing it up seems to be kind of disproportionately big, even if it's subtle and and unconscious, but when in the true self, that the fear of making mistakes of the local self messing up a bit diminishes to a quiet uh, whisper, if anything. So the, the subtext of that is we like ourselves more, and we like ourselves enough that we don't care that much. I mean, obviously we care. We don't want anyone to be hurt around us. And being in the compassionate, empathetic state, that is very unlikely to happen. Um, but we're not here to please others, we're not being people pleasers anymore, we have our power back. And that actually benefits everyone around us. Uh, it stops all those manipulative games, those collusions that occur um, when we're being people pleasers. Because none of us are in our centers then, and you get all the bullying and all the, you know, the subtle manipulation that goes on that makes it all such hell for everyone. And families are the most perfect kind of hotbed of all that um, stuff of any kind of configuration. So, and then, and then, and then, of course, having um, uh, attained to that state of being, we will then deploy the Darius jumping magic trick and jump over all of this and be on the other side of it, looking back, thinking, I'd say, why not let's project all the way into onto, uh, January the 2nd or whenever it is, looking back and going, that really was the most nurturing, beautiful, seamless, smooth, magical, serendipitous, synchronicitous, synchronicitous um, miraculously gorgeous passage I've just enjoyed. How magnificent, how fortunate am I? That was gorgeous. That magic really, really worked. I must try this jumping over things more often. Should we do that? Should we get to January 2nd and be that person looking back thinking that? I think so. So if you're um, feeling the feeling, or getting into this feeling, let us take this opportunity now to go into a joint meditation. Become aware as you close your eyes and settle into yourself that here you are with 200 or so other people of um, a similar quality of spirit from all the way around the world. Everyone here now willing to open their hearts to each other to themselves and to everyone in their worlds. So even just in this first moment, as we become aware of each other, like a, a circle of angels all the way around the planet in another dimension, we've already elicited a, a kind of an opening of the love flow, or an increase of the love flow, not just for ourselves, but for everybody. And it's subtle that it works, it's true. Hi, take a breath, I like I just did, release all the tension in the body on the out breath, do it again, take a breath in and go. Oh, well, let it all go, and one more time, take a breath in, and breathe out, Ooh. and just relax into your skin. Become aware of what's going on within, don't change it, just look at it. Look at your breathing, and look at how you're breathing, and if you're not breathing, if you're holding your breath, if your breath is jagged, and if the breath was a person, a friend of yours, imagine that and just say to it, hey breath, lovely, lovely to have you here. Well, you're an amazing friend. In fact, without you, <laughs> this wouldn't even be happening. So um, please make yourself comfortable in my body and please feel free to slow down, slow down, slow down and soften up. That You've been working so hard. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Relax, breath. I'll have a little holiday here. Just let yourself flow smoothly seamlessly and slowly and silently. 
and the next cell. And you'll notice that as the breath responds to that request, um, your whole body and mind can starts to match that. It becomes seamless feeling and smoother, more silent, more still, more like silk in its quality. And then look at how you're sitting. Um, look at the, the posture that you've adopted without realizing it. Look at your spine and see how aligned or otherwise it is. See how compressed or elongated it is. And um, if your spine is a friend of yours, you say to it now, hey spine, you're amazing. Thank you. you I mean, you are like my major support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've been working so hard and it is nearly Christmas and it's a sad saying, it's the last one of the year, so uh, please feel free to uncouple yourself, just straighten up and enjoy the elongation. I feel your spine smile and go, thank you, thank you, don't mind if I do. And the spine lengthens, like the crown of the head starts pushing upwards towards the ceiling. And then your shoulders, look at them, they're probably up a bit around your ears and a bit narrowed. Speak to your shoulders and say, hey friends, you know, Thank you. you. Without you, I'd not be able to shoulder anything. I have no arms. I wouldn't be able to do anything. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, relax. Let yourself go. Just, just broaden out and feel the shoulders just move out to the sides, each in their own direction. and um, Drop down so they feel really comfortable. And then your breastbone. Say to your breastbone, hey, my friend, thank you, because you know, without you, my heart and lungs would spill out all over the floor. Uh, really appreciate you being there. Um, don't be crumpled, don't be sad, don't be compressed, don't be depressed. Raise up a little, come on, breastbone. Be proud, and let your breastbone raise up. It responds and it raises up a bit. And you feel dignified now. And then your hips, you say to your hips, hey, hips, man, thank you, because without you, I'd not be able to move anywhere. So thank you, thank you. Look, don't be so narrow, let go, let go, take your space, take your space, and feel your hips broaden. Now you'll notice that with the breathing slowed down and the tone of the energy inside the body more silken, and with your mainframe expanded, both in, in height and breadth like this, um, already the sensation of you has is, is improved. It's uh, increased, it's expanded, it's, it's a nicer feeling being you already. And then, Look at your muscles, look at your muscle tone and um, how rigid it is, how tight, how, how held, and uh, or how soft and flaccid, I don't know. But wherever you notice that you have um, tension in the muscles, like the back of the neck, the face, the uh, chest, the sides, the arms, the hands, the belly, the back, the hips, the legs, the feet, wherever you notice that you're holding on for no reason whatsoever, because you're sitting here, you don't need to hold on to anything, just say to your muscles, like, hey muscles, you're an amazing friend to me, thank you, thank you, thank you, because, yeah, I mean, without you, I'd be uh, just skin and bone, so, bless you for being here, and you work so hard for me, but, you know, man, you've gone into overdrive, and you don't have to work this hard, please, just take a break now, you've earned it, you've earned it, and, Feel your muscles go, hey, thank you, yeah. I just feel every muscle group in your body soften. And it doesn't mean they go weak, it just means that they stop holding excess tension. And now you'll notice that your blood, your energy, your vitality, your life force, your own land, vital, is moving more freely through you. I mean, it's a subtle sensation, um, but nonetheless, you can feel it. But there's more of you, more life in you, more alive. Now, uh, Let's get a sense of that. You know how most of the time the energy of your body is up in the upper part of you because you're thinking all the time and, and figuring things out in the brain and the chest gets affected by that. Well, just allow that energy to drop down because it doesn't need to be in the upper body. The upper body actually doesn't need all that energy because it makes it hot. It needs to be cool up there. So just let that heat, because energy is heat, drop down and let it be in the lower part of the body. Now you can feel immediately your head is clear and your lower body feels somehow more activated and yet more stable and somehow more at one with the incredible kinetic fiery power of this beautiful earth that we sit upon. Albeit a little cold on the surface, you go down deep, it's hugely powerful and it's moving through space at such a speed we can hardly block it. 
And now by sinking, you're with that energy. It's a very beautiful sensation. Upper part feeling very light. Now you know how Christmas and buying presents and people and your fears and what people think of you and what you think of yourself and how you look and how others look and how it all looks and all the rest of it draws you forwards into the front of your body because your sense organs all perceive forwardly. Um, and so what's going on around you, what's perceived as going on around you and your story that you're telling yourself about what's going on around you all occurs in the front of your body. It's all out there in the front of you and you're drawn forwards to meet it. And this makes you lose your power. It actually makes you lose your connection with your true self, which sits in the back of you, watching all the time. So now take this beautiful opportunity of saying to your gorgeous person, this self that you've kind of constructed, if you like, concocted, this which Freud called the ego, this constructed self, this illusory self, say to it, hey, you beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece of art, Come on, drop back inside now. Have a break. You've been working so hard. You haven't stopped almost for a whole lifetime. You've been up front there worrying and planning and plotting and scheming. Come on, drop back. And then you feel your beautiful person, which incidentally derives from the ancient Greek word persona, meaning mask, i.e. the front of you, feel this beautiful being just drop back and let it merge with the presence inside of you. Now the way you do this is you, you picture your shoulder blades now as if they're the, <clears throat> the upper part of the back of a very well-designed, comfortable, supportive chair. And now you feel the front of your spine as if that's the next bit down that supports the middle back area. And then you go down to the rear pelvic bones in the sacrum, which comprise the lower part of the, the back of the chair, which supports the lower part of you. And let yourself sink back into this chair, just sink back inside. So all you have to do is just sort of sink back inside. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> Nothing melodramatic about it. It's very discreet. And you just allow yourself to sink back into the back of you. We're not used to doing this stuff because we just don't use the mind this way normally. But it's a very easy thing to do. It's your back, your mind. You can do what you want with it. Bring your person back inside and lean up against your back. And you start to get a glimmer of the sense of this stuff that's been going on in the front of you is actually just a shimmer, it's an illusion. It was just something you created to amuse yourself with. And now you're in the back of you, all it is is a bit of energetic noise really, in the solar plexus, in the chest, in the throat, in the front of the brain primarily. But now to counteract the front brain noise, that's the, the noise of you talking to yourself all the time, let your mind slide back into the back of your head. Imagine that your skull is a cave at the top of a very, very high mountain, a sacred mountain. And there's a little minor earth tremor which knocks your head back a millimeter or so. And your normal being, your little Buddha self who sits in the front of the cave there, worrying, seeing, you know, is it going to be all right out there, gets sort of obliged to slide backwards inside the cave until he or she is kind of leaning up against the rear wall of the cave. And so it's just sitting there going, oh, 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 it's a bit weird. I'm like, hey, hang on a minute. This is very nice in the back of the cave. I don't know why I haven't come here more often. And there you are now, your Buddha self, you with your with the Buddha face, all beautiful and perfect, sitting back with your back leaning up against the rear wall of your skull. And you'll see now that the view inside is one of the most beautiful void. But it is the void that is not empty because it is filled with chi. And down below there, you are sitting right back inside the mountain of yourself. You're right in the back of you. And here you are. You are the presence. Now, what I'd like you to do is to be aware of where you go in the back of you, sinking back even more, almost as if you can go like Narnia. You can go through your own back uh, out behind you. And as you do, you realize that you are actually a lot bigger than what fits in the body. Yeah, in a different dimension, your presence is actually massive massive, it's indescribably huge, epically huge, and here it is behind you, stretching out into infinity behind you, and it's beautiful, this is your primordial self, it has a beautiful, beautiful presence, it is gorgeous, it's nature, it's so pure, this is what the Buddhists talk of when they say, seek the nose on your original face, this is 
your original face. This beautiful comedy you will be in. And this is you. This is really you. Now, from back here, all the way forwards there in the front of your physical chest, there's this breastbone. Now imagine that that splits down the middle and magically opens like a pair of sliding doors to reveal in front of you, at the level of physical heart, this most beauteous, beautiful, magnificent, wondrous looking flower. And it's a mystical flower. It's not something you'd normally get in a flower shop or a garden center. This is something like you've never seen before. This is the sort of flower you get from heaven only. And this flower is so beautiful and it's exuding the most incredibly exotic, erotic, sensual, sensuous fragrance and light. There's a sort of subtle but definable glow coming from it, in, emanating from you and radiating out from you in every single direction, even above the lower to the size and behind you, let alone just in front. And it reaches ubiquitously, it goes everywhere without limit. And simultaneously, the milieu that it generates conducts the love of everyone else back into your heart. So you're being fed even as you feed. You're part of this continuum of love, which is the primordial essence of existence. And here we are, breathing it in, breathing it out from our primordial cells. And behind us, we can feel our ancestors, all of our ancestors, we give thanks to them for getting us to this point. In front of us, we feel our destiny and all our predecessors. We feel them. We know them. They are coming. This is the, the destiny coming to us. And the two of them meet inside of us and cause a beautiful um, explosion, a fusion of energy, which drops down to our heels and bounces back up to our throats and then settles down in the upper chest, very, very slowly, settling further and further down so it nestles in the heart, in the middle of the chest, like a jewel. And you're just breathing in and you're breathing out. And it's no big deal. You just happen to be your big presence now, in the presence of 200 other big presences. And there's a, somehow a sense of an even bigger presence that is all of us and, and includes all of us. And this we call the Tao. And the Tao's smiling now. And the smile is lighting all of our hearts up and making all of us smile from within. And the combined smile of all of us as a reflection of the Tao smiling is causing an emanation of, of true delight to spread to all our brothers and sisters and all our fellow living sentient beings without limit at this moment in time. This obviously includes all those close to us and everybody with whom we will transact over the next two or three weeks. And here we are. Nonetheless, you know that your local self, that is constructed and sits in front of you, is, um, has its various agitations and so on about the upcoming passage of time. Now, we here in our big present state know that that's all nonsense, but nonetheless, we have compassion for this local self. Bless it. You know, what an art form. What an art form. All the struggles it goes through. Um, and uh, so, like, let us... Um, take care of this self now compassionately and conduct a magic trick to get us over, get the, the local self over all this fears about the upcoming passage. So picture you standing in front of a very large range of mountains and it's quite a formidable range of mountains. It's not a range of mountains to be messed with this. I mean, this time of the year, a lot of sun and uh, full moon, I think it is, and um, beaming down. And it's a little bit scary, but also really exciting. And, and you feel slightly daunted, slightly challenged, but with this great sense of anticipation that you are about to do something unprecedented. So this mountain is actually comprised of all your fears this mountain that is in front of you, the bit of the range that's in front of you, is comprised of all your complexes, all your childhood ego defenses that no longer work for you, all your mistaken assumptions and opinions and prejudices, and all the, the evidence, rather, that you built up over the years to justify the stance that you take, whether it's an unconscious or conscious stance. All of that stuff that's blocking you from being the big presence 
over the next two or three weeks, <clears throat> and thereby giving the gift of your true self to everyone around you, and thereby receiving the gift of the true self to everyone around you, and what could be better? All of this is in the mountain. All of this stuff is what the mountain is made of. But we're not going to pickaxe that mountain down. We're not even going to use dynamite. We're not even going to use tactical nuclear weapons on it. What we're going to do is we are now going to access the superhuman power of our primordial selves, which are huge, huge, huge beings. And we are going to jump over the mountain, right over it. It doesn't matter how high you see that mountain is, you are now going to jump over that mountain. And this is what we're going to do. So you turn away from the mountain, just enough to get a bit of a run up, and then you turn back and you look at it, just like an athlete. You look at that mountain and you think, yeah, man, I'm going to take you. <laughs> I'm going to take you right now. And you run and you spring off your strong foot. And with one leap and a bound, that you are flying so high in the sky that you're almost scared of the altitude. You can hardly breathe up here because the, and it's really cold and the air pressure. And it's really quite something. But then you're already going over the top and in this most beautiful, graceful trajectory down the, the, the descending arc. And you land like a cat. From thousands and thousands and thousands of meters up, you land like a cat. Not even a jolt to your system. That's how amazing you are. And you stand there, and you are feeling beautiful and relaxed and powerful. And this is your primordial self. This is the big self now. And here you are. And you're looking. You're actually in 2014 now, January the 2nd. And you're looking forwards into the year, and you're feeling well, this is going to be an amazing year. Not in that silly hysteria of Happy New Year nonsense, but really knowing it, that this is going to be an amazing time for you. You can feel it. Doors are going to open in every direction, and you're going to be led to the denouement of all the withheld secrets and mysteries and stuff that have been bugging you and stopping you. This is the year that you will have everything that you've wanted, that you've worked so hard for for so long. Everything that has been precluded from your craft now to be granted you. You can feel it. You can see it. This isn't hysteria. It's not hyperbole. It's just a sensation of confidence. And then you stop and you think, wow, yeah, wait a minute. That, what I've just been through, that Christmas passage, that Christmas and New Year thing, that thing that I've normally been kind of a bit tense about, maybe a bit scared about, maybe a bit funny about, maybe this, maybe that, that was the easiest, most amazing, smoothest, most silken, most seamless, most beautiful, most harmonious, most enriching, most nurturing, most nourishing, most rewarding, and most healing passage of time I think I've ever had in my whole life. Well, blimey, that is unprecedented. And I want you to stand there now on the 2nd of January 2014, and you transmit telepathically back to your present self now, and say to your present self, hey, this is it. This is reality. This is waiting for you. So relax. Trust it. Be in yourself. Stay in your primordial self. Know that this time sequence doesn't really exist. It's all imaginary. Know that you've already manifested this. This has already happened, and all that has to happen now is you've got to catch up with it. And that is going to be immensely enjoyable for you. I know because I've been there, so I can tell you. It's going to be an amazing, amazing time for you. So relax like a little child, knowing that you've got a beautiful time coming with no disappointments, no letdowns, nothing to be afraid of at all. It's all going to be very, very beautiful. And as you sit here now, this side of the mountain, which doesn't actually exist anymore, see it crumble, see it dissolve, see it completely just not be there anymore. It was just a device we no longer need. As you sit here now, be aware that this sense of beauty, this sense of warmth, this sense of love, is not limited. It's with you. It's holding you. It's all around you. It's connecting you to everyone and everything in this circle and everyone and everything in your life. Now, these people in your life, and the difficult ones especially, are only playing a role. All of them are the Buddha in fancy dress, every single one of them. They might not know it. They might have got so lost in their fancy dress they've forgotten. But everyone is the Buddha. Everyone is the beautiful, radiant Buddha. And now you have the power, being in your background presence now, your big self, to know that, to be able to see the Buddha in everyone. Even the most recalcitrant buggers in your life, you know that beneath that 
there is the Buddha, and it's just the Buddha in fancy dress. You're not called anymore. You don't have to be. There's no obligation to believe in all that nonsense anymore. Here you are in your power. Your heart is open. You're fully grounded. You're back in yourself. If you need to hear this again, hear it again. Listen to the replay when it comes out. It's very powerful. It's very beautiful. I can feel it. You can feel it. We all know it. And now it's time to come back. So, twiddle your toes and twiddle your fingers, twiddle your nose, twiddle your ears, release all your fears and come back here with full of good cheers and here we are, here we are, here we are. It's questions and answers time. I'm back, you're back, everybody's back. Let's go. So, questions and answers. Hello. Hello. Uh, I've got a few comments for you, Stephen, before the questions. Uh, Teresa says, have a wonderful, wonder-filled Christmas time. Thanks for a year full of gems in all the satsangs. My utmost pleasure. You have a wonderful time too. And Malkit's saying, wishing uh, a very happy Christmas and New Year to everyone all over the planet on this webinar and of course to you, Stephen. Thank you. And we mustn't forget all the ones above the planet in the air and the ones under the ground and under the sea. Indeed. And Kathleen says, blessings to all for a glorious new year. Thanks for the soul-soothing satsangs. My pleasure. Thank you for saying that. Okay, so um, we only have one question at the moment, and that is from Jennifer. Um, my job has changed to a very high stress one with more responsibility. How do I stay calm in critical situations? Um. You know what, I think Jennifer would be good to spend time visualizing yourself in these situations that you're projecting through your imagination now. Like pick a typical, a typical situation in which you'd imagine you would get stressed and then see yourself sailing through it without any stress whatsoever. See yourself looking like you're in the back of your body. See yourself looking like your energy's down in the lower part of you. See yourself looking like you've got a length of spine, broad shoulders. See yourself looking like all your muscles are softened. See, <clears throat> see yourself looking like your eyes are very bright and clear, so that you're actually in a state of absolute uh, delight just for being alive, no matter what tasks are, uh, are ahead of you. So yeah, you see that, you visualize it, um, just for a moment, but often. And that sets up the intention and cements it. It becomes strong, and that will then send the right signals to your uh, subconscious and from there to you know, and your autonomic system, which will respond. And you can then anchor it by saying, when I go to work, when I uh, hit a stressful moment, that is when I remember this. That's when I remember this, to come back inside and be the presence. That's when I remember this. And the more I remember to come back inside and be this, the more efficient I am at uh, getting everything done, the more economically it gets done, the more easily it gets done, the more miraculously it gets done, and the better result I get all around. And then you can do an affirmation, which would be, this one works for me a lot, um, I achieve everything here that I have to do um, easily, effortlessly, enjoyably, excellently, economically, efficiently, uh, smoothly, uh, smartly, successfully, swiftly, um, marvelously, and miraculously. That kind of works for me. You can add in any uh, adjectives of the you know that work with that with those letters, E, S, and M. I don't know. They don't have any significance whatsoever. It's just that something I've always done. Um, that would help. And and that's it. That and remembering what we've just done today. Because the more you come into your background presence inside the better you manage everything. And, and it's all that and having the intention to manage everything really well. I mean, stress is only about wanting to, you know, like uh, kind of get good results so that everyone thinks you're okay. You want everyone to approve and, you know, like she's doing a good job. She's, yeah, she's one of the team. She's doing a good job. Good on her. That's what we, that's why. That, and it's great. We need that. It's good that we have that. And that's what makes us do well. So. Um, it's a matter of enjoying it rather than fighting it, in other words. So when you feel the stress, you go, yeah, 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 this is my juice. I need this juice. I need this juice to fly on. But I can regulate it and do something with it. I can adjust it and make it work for me rather than me work for it in the ways I've just described. 
Good luck with that one. The 2014, may it bring you all the success and more than, you, than you've ever actually dreamed of. We have this one from Natasha, who says, I suddenly started weeping silently but copiously during that uh, meditation. Is that weird or okay? Uh, if it feels okay to you, it's okay. You know, but uh, Natasha, the first time I did uh, ayahuasca um, ceremony, I spent the whole night crying. And I was unhappy. And I wasn't actually sobbing even. I just had just rivers of tears, come, what it felt like anyway, rivers of tears just flowing out of my eyes uncontrollably. And it was sort of that poignant um, sensation that can't be described really in simple words that isn't sad, it's not happy, it's momentous. There's a sense of, wow, we've actually come to this point in history. Wow, wow. And I don't know, it, I can't really explain it myself. But I do, I do relate to that. I, I, I've had, I think, you know, that similar experience where we're just triggered. Um, the emotional body is triggered, and it somehow I think it's to do with the emotional body aligning itself with the energetic body and the physical form. And there's this oh, like a jolt because there's probably been a, you know, a residue of unexpressed or or unacknowledged um, emotion that has been going on that hasn't had time to be looked at. And it's probably that, you know, you just come back to yourself and it's that joyful, amazing wholeness that occurs that just elicits. But on another level, it's actually just the diaphragm um, releasing. It's, you know, we, we have to have a relaxed diaphragm to be in good health because that's what operates the breathing. And also the solar plexus is such a crucial part of the body, which is where the diaphragm is located in terms of getting the nerve uh, impulses moving properly around the body and so on. Um, the, um, uh, sorry, I just lost myself there. Uh, yeah, what happens is, is that when we, uh, we get this build-up of stress and the subconscious will release it for us, either through laughter or through crying. And um, it, obviously we prefer laughter, it's much more fun, and that's why we love comedy and, and so on. Um, well, I do anyway. And, um, but, you know, a good cry is just is, is, is maybe even better because the endorphins it releases are much more yin, aren't they? I think, like, yang is, is the laughter, yin is the crying. But either way, it's a way that the body has of getting your diaphragm to release. And, um, and the water through the eyes is to do with the kidney energy as well, because the kidneys are the water element in the body. And it might be to do with when we let go of the anxiety, which is what snags the kidney energy for a moment. You know, we sink into our big presence. Um, all that, the anxiety of the local cell suddenly dissolves, and all that snagged up kidney energy, that water, is suddenly released into the system. And that's what makes the tears come out on an energetic level. Well, Jane says, thank you, tears flowing too, and have been throughout the series. <laughs> well, there you have the explanation, Jane. Good. I mean, good. Yeah, happy tears, I, I, I presume. Now, Misha says, thank you, really enjoyed the meditation. When you set boundaries in your work li and life and hold them, how do you suggest dealing with the vulnerability it can make you feel, like I'm letting someone down and fearful of the result? Yeah, I, I do really understand that. I mean, that's something that I am always looking at, as it, as it always have been. It's a very difficult one, especially with, with the work thing, the kind of work that I do, because it's very human, and it necessarily um, it, it, it requires a certain intimacy that we're not generally au okay fait with, so we mistake it for a different kind of inti intimacy and what have you, and even making distinctions is a bit just semantics, really. Um, and, and so it's, it's always very difficult because we, we want to give from our heart to everybody. We want to receive the best from everybody. And yet, because of the different states of the evolution everybody's at and the different circumstances from moment to moment, we have to uh, uh, put up these, well, put up, we could somehow create energetic, psychoenergetic boundaries around us. And, um, you know, it's like when you bring up a child, you have to create boundaries for it, or it will become unruly and it won't be any good for the child. You love it. You want to give it everything. And you have to show it limitations somehow. It, it would not be good for it otherwise. It would become you know, impossible for it to live in society. And it's the same with our friends and our colleagues and everybody else. And it's a subtle thing. And if you're kind and open-hearted, 
it's very difficult to put up big steely walls, and we don't want to do that. That's horrible. Um, <clears throat> so it's a subtle business, and it takes a long time. In fact, forever, we're constantly working on it. But what I find is, is that by being in my back, like right, taking my space within, like coming back into me, claiming myself, um, this stuff around me all somehow sorts itself out. Um, it, it just becomes evident that there are these natural energetic ley lines around us almost, you know, like these patterns. As we each have a big energy field, and that protects us. And um, for, when you're in the back of you, that starts operating quite strongly. So what I would advise is to focus on visualizing this massive ovoid sphere all around you, a bright white light that protects you from all negativity and also neutralizes any negativity of yours going on the, you know, in the outward direction. Um, and so it keeps everything balanced somehow and everybody feels comfortable around you and you feel comfortable around, around them. Um, and from this perspective, also knowing that everyone has their own energy field and everyone is, as I said before, the divine or the Buddha in, in fancy dress. And, and so we know that when we're in the back of ourselves. And somehow when we, the presence in us addresses the presence in the other, which is the, the meaning of namaste, um, the other knows it and, and respects naturally the space between us. Also, you can help it along with a bit of magic, uh, homeopathic magic, Ignatia, uh, potency one million. Um, you order it from an online homeopathic pharmacy, Ignatia, one M. And you, know, you only need to take one pill, one pill um, at night is best. <clears throat> and that, somehow or other, has this incredible effect on recalibrating your whole boundary uh, thing, uh, really quite remarkably. I, I've never seen it not work with anyone I've ever suggested to take it, and with myself when I did it once. It's unbelievable, really. So do that. Try that anyway. You'll notice it will shift everything quite profoundly without you even having to think about it. Really. Eileen says, uh, hello Doc, is there an exercise we can do to move the energy from the top further down? Hello Eileen. Yes, there are many in fact, but let's try this one. Um, imagine that you have a breathing aperture, like a mouth or a nose type thing, down under your toes on both feet. You know the ridges that are underneath the toes, that before the toe bone meets the foot bone, no, it's not the foot bone, but the main body of the foot. You know, when the, the metatarsal bone meets the main body of the foot, the ball of the foot, there's a ridge right underneath the toes there. Now imagine that there you have breathing apertures, and as you breathe in, you're breathing in through there. It's very nice, you get tingly feet straight away. As you breathe out, you're breathing out through there. Again, you get the tingle. And you need to do that three times, four times, five times, nine times, whatever, enough to get the feeling. And once you've got it, within five to ten minutes, the energy of your body would have been drawn downwards. If you then repeated that on an incredibly up-in-the-head energy day, uh, say once an hour for three hours or so, that will settle your energy for the next three or four days at least. Uh, the other thing is to do um, Taoist standing exercises, what we normally think of as qigong, um, where you stand in a horse posture, for example, which is like you imagine yourself as John Wayne riding a very, very fat, fat horse so that your legs are very, very wide open if you can get that image. And you're sitting on the saddle and you've got your legs in the stirrups, but the, but the feet, although they're in the stirrups in your visualization, you're actually on the ground, obviously. And both feet are facing forwards as they would be in the stirrups. You know, they wouldn't be pointing outwards, would they? They'd be, both feet would be facing directly forwards in the stirrups. So same as that. Your knees would be really deeply bent um, like that and your bum would be tucked in a little bit because you wouldn't want to be arching your back sitting on the horse, which you want to be bowing your back out behind you a bit so it's straight, so you could withstand shot as the horse did whatever it did. And then you just take the horse out of the pitch, there you are standing. And, um, but you actually do it in real life, not just imagining it. And um, Although imagining it will help as well, that's a really good exercise. These things work like that. But if you can do it standing in real life and just, you know, real Tai Chi, Qigong Taoist maniacs do it for like 45 minutes, two hours a day. Um, uh, uh, me, I haven't got the patience for it. I never have that. I did used to do it a couple of like when I was a kid, I used to do that. And it is amazing, because really, when you stand for just a few minutes, I'd say four minutes or whatever, 
like that. Um, with your eyes open, just being one with everything, breathing, being in the back of you. Do it every day. Your inner stability grows exponentially. It really is quite remarkable. You just feel more stable, less flappy and less able, to, less susceptible to what's going on around, to what people are doing around you and stuff, you know, the things they say or do that might otherwise upset you or whatever. You just don't. You just are solid like a rock inside. That, that I would really highly recommend. Malkit says, uh, thank you for all your input this year in Satsang's liberation trainings. And as you said, this has been an amazing year, and I feel that it's been an amazing year for me, full of achievements and not a lot of stress. And I'm sure that doing all the training I've done with you has done this. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. Lots of love from Malkit. Have a great holidays. Thank you. Malkit, you are a very, very beautiful, wonderful person you are. You're so grateful. You have so much gratitude. Um, it's like a, a magic boom that spreads. And I feel it. I know you do thank me a lot in various messages, and I do, you know, as often as possible. It's a bit like it, I, don't, I don't want you to think it's just words when I'm saying it's my pleasure. <laughs> I really, really mean it. I really appreciate your level of gratitude. I don't, you know, I take it partly personally, but, I, you know, I just take it as gratitude for life, as we all have, as I'm grateful for you being here. You're a lovely, lovely mirror. And it brings up in my mind, and yes, I, I'm with you, the, the techniques are really powerful. I mean, I, I did myself apparently uh, have cancer and then it disappeared. Um, uh, and I, I was just smooth as silk through that, and it, I, it was from using this stuff. I could feel it. Um, I'm not gloating over that. I don't, I'm not being cocky about it. It, it. it was a very, it's humbling, you know, to go through that, but... It was a, a pretty astonishing sensation of stability um, through that. And then there was financial um, mayhem caused by uh, a, a situation last year uh, with, the, with the event of the big on and all the rest of it that, you know, kind of had caught up finally. Uh, uh, that was also like a major, major challenge, which I managed to uh, banish away like I did the cancer as well. Um, beautifully and uh, with the help of a couple of very, very good friends of mine, not lending me money, but just helping me um, focus right, you know, and, and uh, what have you. And again, through that was the most lovely serenity. And in both cases, seeing the worst that could happen and being okay with that even. It's like, fuck it, if that's what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. I'm not going to let it spoil my delight in being. And it, to have that inner strength is the most incredible gift we could ever ask for. I mean, I've been working on it to get to that, but however long, you know, I'm nearly 60 and I've been doing this shit since I was 11. And, uh, you know, it's a long time coming. But, um, you know, we we, uh, we get there quicker and quicker as time goes by, obviously. You know, I've gone through the process of, of uh, the confusion and the working it out when there wasn't the availability of clear instruction, uh, because that's just the way it was. Um, and, and that's what my life's been about, making it clear so everyone can get it get it fast and people do like you have this year I mean the, the progress you've made has been amazing and so yeah I give deep thanks for being in this role it's an amazing role to have had it's been bloody difficult at times but it's an amazing one to have and the joy of being able to transmit this stuff to people so profoundly and have and see it have the effect is partly amazing because of the internet it wouldn't be this way otherwise and but really what an amazing time we're in and how beautiful to be able to to share this and what a position to be in. So your gratitude is taken with utmost gratitude. Thank you. Uh, for the nuts of Taoism, the, uh, because I've been like mad busy and some weird shit happens with technology, it's not really paying attention. When I did all those, it took fucking hours and I, I messed up on some of the renderings. So there's a few of the nuts that are all over the place. I'm going to spend four or five hours tomorrow putting them back in order and re-uploading them and whatever. So the nut five, nut six, sorry that there's been a delay. They will come. You'll just have to take your nuts more at a time than normal. I hope you've enjoyed those. I love those nuts and downs. That was like, uh, it was Sue's idea. She's the one that comes up with the brilliant ideas. You know, like, let's give everyone those. And I thought, oh, a lovely, lovely thing. It was me that came up calling them the nuts and downs. And, you know, because it's like, you know, like, what's the nuts of this? Where do you get down to it? And I thought, if I, I was sitting in Nice, actually, I'd been working with uh, my friend there on music project, and, uh, come up for air, gone out to the court, sitting in the sunshine, drinking a coffee. I love doing that there, especially. It's one of my favorite things and places to do it. And I sat there and with a notebook, because I didn't want to do it with 
actually, I would have done it with a computer, but I can't see it in the sunshine. I uh, just wrote them by hand. It's like being back at school. It took ages and ages, but I got, it was like, if I'm going to leave the planet any time now, and somebody, before I went, I had to say, hey, look, what, you know, this is what Taoism is in a nutshell. The, the, that's what inspired it. And it was a really great exercise. It took, then took ages of typing it. Then it took bloody ages recording it or I'm putting the music with it. But it was really beautiful doing it, and it will be even more beautiful when it's all sorted and done. Oh, that's it. That's my story of the nuts of Taoism. <laughs> um, just to let everybody know, um, one to five are fine, and they are all uploaded. And if you go to barefootdoctorglobal.com forward slash nut dash five, um, you'll be able to access one, two, three, four, and five all there. Um, and we've got some really good Christmas offers as well, discounts and introductory offers, one of which is um, there are three free meditation pods with the next satsang series, which is called Fresh Creations, and it starts on the, I think it's the 5th of January, but if you book before Christmas, you get three uh, free med meditation pods with, uh, with that. So we've got one uh, last comment from Inga here, Stephen. She says, I wish you a lovely year end and I'm sending you lots of love and gratitude for your gifts to me and so may so many others through this year's satsang. Wish I had been able to join you on time today. Better late than never. Can't wait for this one to arrive by email. I cannot tell you how wonderful your gifts have been for me. Hugs, Inga. Oh, Inga, you lovely woman. Thank you. That's Bless you. Bless your heart. And everybody here, really, thank you. And for this year, what an amazing year. It's been so lovely sharing it with you in this way. Wow. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? What a great life we've had. And um, I wish you all the most wonderful, as we just sort of did here, as did over the next few weeks. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the new year, after January the 2nd, when you'll be that person uh, you are already, really. And uh, January the 5th, yeah, come. It's going to be beautiful. Fresh creations, starting new. It's going to be beautiful. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sue. You're amazing. And um, thank you to the Dow for making all this be here. What a laugh. All right, bye.